It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 277 at block height 696,108 on Monday, August 16th. So what is up? Long live the U.S. Empire. Oh, right to the throat. <laughs> Oof, I was going to say the block height, it's high, but you're right. The fall of the empire... But don't worry, the Space Force is here to tell us all about what Bitcoin is. Wait, I thought this was long live the Chinese Empire. Qing Yongyi. Yeah, it's been quite the uh, shit show to watch unfold, but uh, it was kind of inevitable. At a certain point, we were going to pull out of Afghanistan, and at a certain point, the uh, tally with the band Hammer was going to come back in. And they're doing that, and... I imagine a lot of the people who decided that they were going to take the risk of helping us out while we were there on our venture are feeling pretty bad about now. And I feel sorry for them. I'm really sorry, like genuinely. As somebody that was there, I knew we had to get untangled out of that mess. I knew it was always going to be ugly. I wish it was a lot sooner, but it's happening now. So. I mean, dude, I just don't even know what to think at this point. Like, I just keep thinking back to that documentary this is what winning looks like and listening to an american soldier talk about how the head of the afghan unit that they were training openly molested little boys and they couldn't do shit about it because that would start a massive international incident and i just can't help but think despite all of the people in the government and the forces we set up over there that aren't like that good riddance to that power structure yeah i think that's the way the afghan people felt too i mean as far as just looking at footage of the the entry and the exit i mean like a lot of uh people i mean they're caught up in this uh this departure of these forces of our forces and i mean like i'm pretty sure that you know they are really scared of the potential fallout of uh being under the rule of the top of, of the tally with the ban hammer because i mean you know they could definitely come back and uh and cause we saw a lot of stuff you know as far as like what they did when they took over in afghanistan originally at the stadium and the way that they've had public executions but you know that's afghanistan it's the edge of the world as somebody that was there in the boonies of the world like things have not changed since before christ for sure like it's if you just go over there it's th that's always been that way I mean, and I don't know what the United States was thinking going over there that they're going to change it. I mean, I was just a young kid, 18, 19 over there. I'm like 38 now. I mean, uh, it's been a long freaking time we've been there. But, I mean, they are always seen as like the National Guard of the country. So they're coming back in, and it looks like, you know, they have the support of most of the people. And, unfortunately, the people that worked with us... They're going to see, unfortunately, what it's like, what happens when you work with the United States in war and uh, they can't actually, you know, follow through. I mean, it's called the Graveyard of Empires for a reason. And we uh, paid for uh, a bunch of nice weapons for them, all left behind. Well, yeah. they, if you're going to have a competition, you want it to be fairer, right? Um, B, this is about the first thing I've really seen the media chafe Biden at all on. And not that he doesn't deserve to be chafed on this, though I personally agree that America shouldn't be in Afghanistan anymore. You know, there's righter ways and wronger ways to effectuate that, right? And he got a lot of flack from some people for that decision not to pull out on the date that the U.S. had agreed with the Taliban 
uh, because it would be giving Donnie a win, which is kind of sad that our politics is to the point of because it's not giving Donnie a win, we break our agreement with the Taliban and then they come back and break their agreements with us. So not not unexpected, but I would say that the the friction around Biden, this this shows that Biden doesn't just do everything necessarily that his handlers may want or or what have you, or else part of the plan is to get the rabble rousing going so we can get back in there by September eleventh. Maybe maybe we'll come back with Helen Fury by next month. What do you guys think? I don't know. I mean I I have two quick things I just wanted to say before I answer that, but did did anybody else see the meme? of George Bush just fucking nodding his head to some fucking great tunes. That that feeling when you started a 20-year war and people are arguing whether it's Trump or Biden's fault. Mm-hmm. You, you gotta give Biden credit for the very least of standing up and doing this. Just like, you gotta give credit Trump for standing up and trying to make this happen. Now, were there faults in both? Probably a lot, right? Like Trump could have pulled this off under his own administration's time frame, but he didn't, right? And it's very evident that the military industrial complex does not want us out of there. And I think the behavior that Trump kept seeing was he'd ask his generals, how soon could they pull out? Oh, in six months, sir. Okay, great. We're going to pull out in six months. Six months comes. Are we pulling out yet? Oh, no, sir. We need six more months. He literally literally at a press conference a month a month ago said none of this would happen and then it did yeah, yeah well I mean, biden's not the smartest uh smartest guy in the room no it looks awful i mean for him i mean there's a reason he's at camp david hyden and you know the press secretary is nowhere to be seen on any of this and i mean there's not the i mean i agree with you but i mean like <laughs> Military industrial complex wants a military industrial complex, and it's going to keep that complex going. But I think they know that is a losing battle, and there's not the political will to fight it. There's not the taxable will to fight it. Like people don't have the stomach for it in this country anymore. I don't think, and you're not going to be able to sell them that. Now, this domestic terrorist at home, that's a lot easier. You know, you're not halfway around the world. Like you know, you got people in your backyard that you know, voted the wrong way. And so, I mean, that's the way they're arguing, like these, uh, you know, these generals that were in charge of this uh, country's military. I mean, it does look, as far as, like, the way Janine opened it is right. I mean, this looks like the evident fall of the American empire. It's going to look bad and reflect bad on the USD. And certainly so for settlement mechanisms between countries and everything, like, I don't know where this goes, but I don't think it's back to Afghanistan. Hopefully not. It's definitely um, true. You can only maintain so many fronts. So if this may just be a signal that it's time to oppress the Americans instead of oppress the Afghanis. And, you know, we probably deserve that, you know, because that's our fight to fight, right? On this subject, I recommend checking out the WikiLeaks files, a portion of which focuses on Afghanistan based on the uh, material released by WikiLeaks. I guess last thing I really want to say on this is, so I learned something interesting today that I never knew, but apparently the entire beginning of the Taliban was literally local people um, rising up against the warlords in power at the time and deposing them literally for kidnapping and molesting children. So like, that that is how the Taliban started, um, you know, killing pedophiles and taking them out of power. Yeah, it'd be good if everybody goes back and does a little history and just uh, look at the WikiLeaks stuff. And for sure, it's a uh, it's a good thing that we're not entangled up there anymore. But I don't think it could have been approached in a more in, in a worse way. For sure, like uh, the previous administration should have made a move out before the next administration came in if they were serious about this, because they should have known that this was going to happen. But yeah, we'll see how long that USD settlement mechanism keeps on churning. All right. So I guess are we ready to start a bunch of arguments and touch the third rail, guys? What's the third uh, rail? Well, um, 
Mr. John, or no, not John, um, Jason Lowry from the U.S. Space Forces, um, a former intelligence analyst, um, you know, recently posted on LinkedIn um, a thesis that he wants to write, pretty much modeling Bitcoin from the point of view of um, warfare strategy. So pretty much applying the types of strategic and game theoretical models that military officials do to actual wars to Bitcoin itself in the sense of pretty much um, equating the expenditure of energy by Bitcoin miners as the exertion of force by military superpowers and effectively kind of making the analogy that in a war historically, you have generally leveraged that exertion of force or energy in order to dominate and take control of kind of officiating who owns property. Like ultimately in a war like that, you know, the winner is the one who decides property rights. The assigning of property, the, the respecting of that property right claim to everything. And this is literally entirely the reason for fighting wars in the first place, is to dominate resources and then control the property and the ownership of those resources. And so he, he's effectively, like the whole thesis would be modeling the Bitcoin network under that kind of strategic game theoretical framework in which miners competition and expenditure of energy um, is ultimately to the ends of winning so to say by appending the most recent block which updates and decides the consensus of property ownership and distribution um, this is actually um, something he wants to do towards the goal of just thinking about less violent um ways that military forces could kind of engage in this fundamental activity which is a core reason for them existing in the first place um and i'm actually really interested in kind of seeing this thesis if it's ever written and published publicly but half of this space has just lost their minds over the notion of comparing anything in Bitcoin to violence. And it's gotten to the point where Jason outright stated that Bitcoin is not voluntary. That in fact, if this does succeed, you will be forced to accept Bitcoin, to use Bitcoin as it becomes a dominant money and medium of exchange. And that the longer you wait, the more you are losing in terms of purchasing power and wealth by not acquiescing to Bitcoin forcing itself on the world. And it's gotten to the ridiculous point where people are claiming this is like some government propaganda that's going to convince everybody to look at Bitcoiners as terrorists. If you think this is what's going to push everything over that edge, then maybe you shouldn't be in this space. But I just kind of want to point out, like, this is not a new debate. Like, that is absolutely a fucking debate that was going on back in 2013 when I first arrived in this space, whether the end game and phase of Bitcoin is voluntary or not. And, like, it's not a new thing. Like, this is not some fucking piece of government propaganda to, to get us all labeled terrorists. It's literally one of the oldest fucking philosophical debates in the entire Bitcoin space. That if Bitcoin does succeed, inevitably, it does not become a voluntary thing. It becomes something you must engage with out of necessity or, like, be screwed. The same way that the state existing, hey, I could sit here and fucking wax all day um, philosophically about how every interaction you have with the state is voluntary. And if you have a problem with it, opt out. In practicality, that argument's total horseshit. You can't. So <laughs> like, I, I just find it really weird and kind of funny how the debate and dynamic around all of this has kind of spun the last few days because really all I see is just an interesting 
like strategic or game theoretical analysis of Bitcoin coming. And it's got it's gone full retard to the point that people are like trying to pretend that this long existing philosophical debate in this space is like some government conspiracy. And it's so ridiculous. Yeah, I saw this story and thought something I mean, like I thought something similar. I was like, oh wow, you know, it's interesting that some guy with the US Space Force is like thinking about this game theoretically about, you know, Bitcoin mining as being like the uh, ends to a means and thinking about dominant control property rights. I mean, it it was definitely like just an interesting way to look at things, but I didn't think much further than that. I was like, well, it's interesting that the Space Force guy is doing it. That was it. And then you go to Twitter and it's like, you know, oh, this guy is this or that's our, you know, everybody's paying attention to him. It's just like, to me, it shows the story really is just how crazy Twitter's gotten it's uh it's really a bunch of noise at a certain point where it's like i get it like um you know we gotta you know strain everybody but i mean like this is uh it's a little pretty crazy i mean it seems like the guy's just really active on twitter like the fact that the post came from linkedin was a weird fact but i mean ultimately yeah who cares it's just like uh it's not gonna all of a sudden change it to where bitcoiners are terrorists like they're already talking about terrorists around here and i mean like at a certain point we'll go we'll fall under there like uh you know that's where you know i switched the name to revelation rick it's no longer crypto rick because like we're in the end times like get ready to be called whatever but it's not going to be because this guy at the space force yeah i do i i just it, it, it's it's kind of funny like i really kind of am starting to appreciate mr hoddle and his attitude and just how he engages with this space i i really am it's literally just like the same fucking arguments over and over year after year and 90 percent of the people having them have no conception that it's like hey guys this argument like happens every year w- what are you talking about with all this retarded government conspiracy shit it is crazy the level of people that we've picked up in the price rise and i mean i imagine a lot of them have just never even thought about going to the old bitcoin talk forums or just like you know asking around and looking about what discussions have happened in the past so they just see something and they're reactionary i mean like these people have been you know we've just scooped them up in the crazy years that we just went through and so everybody's a little more attuned for the headlines and not really looking for the meat of the story. Yeah. I'm just glad that everybody now recognizes that speech is in fact violence and therefore Bitcoin is violence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, after I saw this and I saw what was going on, I really wanted to like, I don't tweet much anymore. Cause like, I'm just like, Twitter's upsetting, but, uh, I was going to tweet like, uh, good morning. Bitcoin is war. That is all. <laughs> I mean, dude, it, it's like, it's it's just, people get too binary with open-ended, nuanced, philosophical things. Like, if you can argue that the state is not something purely voluntary because you have the right to opt out and pay like a 15% exit tax and need to figure out all the logistics of like, uh, if you can, you can philosophically argue that the state and complying with it is compulsory because of all these these extra barriers and frictions and implications of not consenting to it then that same argument applies to bitcoin i mean i I don't necessarily agree with it in the end but it's like if you can make an abstract argument for one situation then that abstract argument is also a valid argument in an equivalent situation Well, we'll see how the story develops, but I'm sure everybody's going to just keep following along with Jason, whatever, is it Jason Lowry? Yeah. See what he thinks in all of his little nuggets of wisdom. So, Fudd, I think you might be a little intrigued by this next one. You talking lightning? Well, hold on, I need to take my medicine and my lighter's being stupid. (laughs) Cannabis is medicine. 
So, Urbit is something I don't think we've ever directly talked about except in relation to other things on this show. Um, but the general idea behind Urbit is think about if everybody had their own little virtual machine with its own operating system that could run on top of anything that has its own programming language and that has its own networking stack to be able to make network communications and services between everybody's like personal little virtual machine. So trying to, on top of all the insecure garbage out there today, make this virtual little box of safety where people can actually make a, a little network just between these things and use as a means of communication, like building internet-based services on top of, et cetera, et cetera. And it's actually a very interesting process or project. If you are interested at all in the process of trying to unfuck and fix the giant mess that is the modern computing stack, and you haven't heard of this before, I highly recommend you take a dive and look through it. Really, like the only criticism I have for this is that their kind of namespace, like their equivalent of DNS, where you can, in a user-friendly way, find services and shit, um, they use Ethereum for that, which, holy shit, you guys should get the fuck away from that already. But um, they are putting out a bounty um, after having recently finished implementing a Bitcoin wallet in this stack for lightning integration so <clears throat> and, and they actually want to take it to the point too of potentially creating their own little sub network of lightning nodes within urbit that only talk to other lightning nodes within the urbit network and effectively trying to establish kind of a, a bridge system um, for the little subnet of Lightning on Urbit to be able to talk to the wider Lightning network. But um, yeah, this, if, if this bounty is actually fulfilled, somebody winds up doing this, this could get very 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 fucking interesting and i say that as somebody who is pretty bearish on the whole concept of let's rebuild the whole internet on top of lightning um you know things like sphinx chat um impervious etc all, all of these using the lightning network as a more general networking stack projects i'm not really sold on the viability of them long term but if there is any kind of environment or, or way that that type of shit could work or be a viable thing long term, it's going to be something like this that isn't just doing like one application on something or one service, but actually baking this in to a, a new generalized computing and networking stack. Not just an application that does this one thing, but a fully programmable environment capable of it being extensible, having anything people can come up with in this general extensible environment being baked into the single stack. So like this, I want to see somebody get after this and see what happens here. Yeah. It is fun in that it is a completely functional from scratch uh, computing environment uh, that these guys built for themselves to basically reown internet architecture, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, they debuted a Bitcoin wallet maybe a little bit before summer sometime. I, wa I want to say that was three or four months ago. Uh, there were some videos out around that. It's great that they've already made it to lightning. Um, fantastic. Keep it up, boys.
Yeah, I mean, like, uh, is the link to the bounty in the show notes? Because certainly, guys, like, uh, we need some somebody on top of that. Dude, the only person, you know, actually, I'm gonna go retweet this right now. But I was about to say, like, the only person I saw like have any reaction to this on Twitter was uh, Lisa from Blockstream. Like, that's it. Well, yeah, we need to get more people talking about it because if we have, like, uh, like you're saying, you know, just having this really clean way to uh, try out and hack together new things, like, yeah, like uh, with Bitcoin and Lightning, like, let's do it. It looks like they got some, uh, I don't know, Louisiana plates, Urbit, Sportsman's Paradise on their Twitter. I like that, too. Good job. Let's fix computing, boys and girls. All right, so some more lightning news, right? Indubitably. Indubitably. So this actually should have been in the last episode, but this is one of those instances of we start recording, stop, and then I see something. So version 0.10.1 of C Lightning just dropped. And this has a lot of fun stuff. Um, so this has experimental support for liquidity ads, um, which is the decentralized way to kind of do what uh, Lightning Pool is doing and source uh, receiving liquidity across the network, um, which I'll get into a little more in a second. Um, but also has... Um, support for bolt 12 on um, lightning offers which would replace the um, current invoicing schemes with something a lot more generalized that would have your node effectively contact the um, receiving node through the offer and from there get a one-off payment be able to support um, you know recurring subscription payments and you know just completely simplify generalizing lightning invoices which are currently just for the most part one-off payments that are good once um and you're gonna have to go get a new one for new interaction it's just not a foundation suitable for a good user experience and bolt 12 is going to have lots of uh lots of impacts there fun stuff but Onto the liquidity ads. Um, this is a huge fucking thing because we pretty much Lightning has handled receiving liquidity in kind of the first phase of things one way. Um, we just go find somebody we know and go, hey, can you open a channel to me so I can receive money? or count on your wallet operator to do that for you. Um, so entirely social-based, entirely trust-based for service providers. Lightning Pool as a marketplace, I thought was kind of the very beginnings of a second phase for that, where you have a centrally coordinated market mechanism accomplishing that. Well, that hasn't really caught on much because everybody's still counting on centralized services going to people they know socially etc um well we haven't even really gotten into the second phase and here comes liquidity ads which could arguably constitute the starting of a third phase just advertising that you are willing to lease a channel with liquidity um just like uh lightning pool on the actual routing gossip or routing graph of the Lightning Network itself. And this pretty much builds on the dual funding setup that C Lightning um, dropped in the last release that allows two parties to negotiate both adding liquidity to a channel on each side instead of the kind of prior restriction that whoever initiates the channel opening is the only one providing funds. And this is a really nice setup in terms of kind of advertising things in a certain way that allows automated heuristics to just kind of get set by the user and handled in the background. Um, for instance, um, you know, with Lightning Pool doing this, um, when you 
have a channel lease open to you, it's actually time locked so that the provider of that liquidity um, is incapable of closing that channel until the lease expires so that somebody can't just, um, you know, take money from you for receiving liquidity and then close it out and not honor the lease that they sold. Um, well, this um, advertising mechanic allows a node to advertise the base fee that they're going to charge for a lease. So like 1K sats, no matter how much is in the channel, et cetera. Um, a fee basis um, that's going to adjust based on how much liquidity is included in that, as well as a funding weight, which is going to guarantee that whoever is kind of initiating this and purchasing a lease um, is going to pay for the on-chain fees um, to whatever weight um, or fee rate they set to cover your inputs so that when you sell a channel lease to somebody in this way, um, they're going to be paying the on-chain fees for your inputs, so that's not some cost that you have to worry about. Um, and then another interesting aspect of this is a um, kind of a, a max channel fee, although this, you can't really enforce this. This is kind of just more of a trust-based thing. Um, but you can kind of advertise um, like a max fee that the person buying your liquidity um, can charge for routing payments across their nodes. Um, I, I think with the idea of like um, that being some kind of guarantee that if they don't exceed this rate, you can now count on some percentage or some decent volume of payments going through that channel to earn you fees because the fee is not outrageously high. And now there's there's not a, a way to really enforce that, um, strictly speaking, but you know, yeah. But anyway, um, yeah. So this is kind of the potential to take what Lightning Pool is doing as a centrally coordinated service, and just make this a decentralized thing on the Lightning network itself. And I think that is even bigger than Lightning Pool was. Yeah, I mean, this sounds incredible. I mean, liquidity ads, I mean, it sounds like something that we've been needing on the Lightning Network for a while as far as just uh, general maintenance and upkeep to keep things functional because I know it has sort of been, like you're saying, sort of just uh, going back to the people that are known through uh, through social networks and um, similar just feeding those channels that they uh that started that opened the channel. So, I mean, it's, uh, it sounds pretty, uh, like it's going to be, once this rolls in, it's going to be pretty awesome. I mean, it, it already is rolled into 0 0.10.1. So that's awesome. Like, I can't wait to see uh, the effects of it. If your service can be turned into a protocol, it will be. That is the double edged sword. That is Bitcoin. All right. Any more lightning comments? Well then, let's talk for a second about some big investment, big players. You guys know Coinbase? Coinbase? They just IPO'd? Mm. Oh yeah. So, uh, we got this story from Barons.com written by Ed Lynn about Intel's recent investment in Coinbase. Intel. So yeah, it looks like Intel now owns 3,014 shares from the recent listing of Coinbase. Coin stonks uh, on the stonk exchange. Coin was listed at two hundred and fifty dollars, and Intel bought around eight hundred thousand dollars worth at what looks like two hundred sixty-four dollars and sixty cents a share. And we know from we know that from their recent public disclosure of second quarter earnings. And as of the time of recording, this uh, price of the stonk coin is down. Or is yeah, it's close to uh, two hundred fifty-seven dollars. And I mean, it's also very possible that Intel invested in Coinbase before their IPO. We don't know that, but uh, Ed Lynn makes that speculation in this article. So the story really isn't the amount uh, or big earnings. It really is all about the relationship. Intel investing in Coinbase shows there's potential. Uh, the chip giant could be thinking about uh, entering the you know Bitcoin arena, and as a, a huge chip manufacturer. 
that should eventually lead to the road of creating Bitcoin miners. But I don't know, you know, the story was all just about the initial investment, but that's kind of my takeaway from the story. What do you guys think about it? I mean, I'm not really sure because like me and FUD talked about this when this first got published and it's like, it does show some kind of interest on some level from Intel in this space. And, you know, I, I've thought for years, it's inevitable. Eventually when things get big enough, Intel's going to start making Bitcoin chips. I mean, how could they not? But, you know, like FUD pointed out, it's, this is like such a tiny insignificant amount of money for Intel. It's kind of just like, what? Yeah, I'm kind of in that bucket too. You know, oftentimes when companies are going to collab on something or have, say, some common IP, uh, one will invest in the other as basically a, a show of commitment uh, towards whatever they're doing together. I've definitely seen this across multiple projects I've been on or around. And that's kind of what's implied here because 800 grand is kind of take it or leave it for either of those companies. That's not a big deal. It's the fact that you bought it that matters more. Uh, so I look forward to seeing what proprietary hardware Coinbase spins out here in a couple of quarters. Because, mm -hmm. you know, my, my first thought was mining chips. That's going to be what fucking prints the most money in the long term. But like, yeah intel is intel like they can do a lot more than just mining asics like what about hsms or security products or etc like and that's something i didn't even really consider until our last com conversation on the matter yeah i'm trying to remember what we last covered in terms of intel's comments it was around the time they were talking about texas foundries and they were talking about taking more outside uh proprietary chip um, manufacturer for just whomever in the market. They've traditionally not focused on that the same way some other manufacturers have. Um, this fits with that. Yeah, I mean, I haven't really seen that many smart plays from Intel lately. I mean, I wouldn't expect them to take the smartest move, but I mean, like it, I mean, yeah, maybe just like a hardware wallet you know, interacted with Coinbase or something. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, I'm just looking at similar models as far as like uh, what Shapeshift just did where they're like, you know, they tied in some token to, uh, to you know, these hardware wallets and now supposedly the exchange is decentralized. You know, it's not really a corporate entity anymore. Like they're going to wrap up. But I mean, like, you know, Coinbase, you know, if they want to... <laughs> I don't know. They might go the route of the Bitcoin bank. They might follow Shapeshift down that road or, you know, might be just, they're just getting their feet wet. I don't know. Just haven't seen a smart move from Intel lately. So we'll see what they do. Well, I can't. they've, they've kind of got the dumpster fire of like 30 years of chips being fundamentally wrecked due to speculative like execution <laughs> vulnerabilities. So. Yeah, this this sounds like a great uh, idea. Having a hardware wallet connect to your KYC Coinbase account running on Intel chips. This sounds like a great marriage. Oh, well, it's all going to be built on top of Uniswap and Ethereum, don't you know? <laughs> I'm just joking. But don't I mean, like, joke because the idiots can't tell when you joke. Okay, well, I just Shit. joke. Shit coins on shit chips with shit base. Well, if it's that all the way down, you can't really notice it that much. All right, but what other what big crazy shit happened in the world of mining that I barely heard a peep about? Yeah. So. Everybody's heard of BlackRock, the investment group, more or less. They, you know, they like to buy American houses. They've got trillions under management. You know, they're doing work. There is evidently also a BlackRock Petroleum Company out of, I believe, Texas here uh, that has some leases going on. Uh, they're out of Nevada, rather. Uh, it has some leases going on up in Canada uh, to do oil and gas mining. Uh, it sounds like what 
is getting talked about, which also didn't really hit headlines, it might be the terms they talked about it in, uh, is that these guys are setting up uh, on-site Bitcoin mining uh, in on some of their Canadian properties. Uh, they are partnering with a Chinese uh, mining company called Optimum Mining Host Limited Liability Co. Uh, to service and host some of these miners. Um, the weirdest thing about these press announcements, and I went and found a really detailed one, is none of them talk about megawatts or power basis. They all talk about units of miners, which is not usually how these things are talked about. Usually we talked about these in megawatts terms. We're, we're going to put so many megawatts online by quarter whatever, right? Because that's really the only way that makes sense. These guys are talking about 1 million mining units. And then they start talking about all the different places they could go and all that. And some people were saying, oh my God, a million machines. That's far too many. Um, and it probably is. I'm, I'm trying to remember what the characterization was. It's like if they get to a million on new machines, that's something like a quarter of the current Bitcoin network hash power. Uh, but come on guys, let, let's talk about these things in power terms because this is how we're doing it these days. But I mean, all, all the same, it's just one more oil and gas producer, in this case, uh, America based, but operating in Canada, that they're bringing miners on site to take care of waste gas type issues. Hey. Also, though, man, like that type of hash rate, like one, people shouldn't make assumptions about all new hardware, but like that type of hash rate has definitively just been sitting idle before in Bitcoin's history. Um, when Hydro Quebec put a moratorium on new mining operations because of a huge, insane like request that nobody believed the size of um that wound up being like a lot of big groups like bitmain and blockstream and etc um yeah it came out later that year that bitmain actually had somewhere between one to two thirds of the network hash rate depending on the hardware model sitting as unsold inventory they had to declare that during their ipo um attempt so yeah People should not like just assume that oh, a huge percentage of the Bitcoin hash rate and chips sitting around not being used. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, right, bro. Um, that's going to be fucking normal in the long term as miners commoditize. You can have 10 times the Bitcoin networks like hash rate and chips sitting around idle and it doesn't matter if the electricity to run them is not available profitably or even just available. So like people guffawing and writing off things like that, you're not using your head. That's probably going to be the norm in like 10 years. Yeah, it's certainly not a trivial amount of hash rate to see today, but it's, it's hard to say what that would be like in the future. And it's also hard to say how that stuff flows. Uh, you know, one other thing to note of, on this story anyway, is that this story is about a two year contract with this Chinese company to operate with 12 month extensions on that as options. Um, so they are talking about doing this for the term. Uh, one other interesting detail in there is they say the electrical cost uh, to supply the miners under this contract will be around three cents Canadian per kilowatt hour. Mm -hmm. Which is pretty darn cheap. Yeah, that's a good deal. I mean, it does bring back, but I just remember the story where we talked about the Fidelity investment uh, in marathon mining. And BlackRock was also in uh, and holding a marathon mining, which Marathon, what they talked about, they had several hundred thousand units offline and they were awaiting deployment. Might have even been million, not million, but hundred thousand. They said they several hundred thousand units offline that they were just awaiting deployment and, uh, you know, that they don't um, – they don't actually uh, own any of the host sites. They just have like they work out contracts similar to this. And this site might be the I mean, like as far as like new mining operations go that are big pool, big, you know, uh, big groups. I mean, it seems like they're trying to do this as far as just like they will have large amounts of hardware offline sort of waiting to go for a cheap contract. 
Mm -hmm. And the more you have waste energy factor into that, the more that's going to start undercutting on the grid miners. But also, like, the more wasted energy used, like, the more mobile and fluctuations in fucking hash rate you'll probably see when you have contracts come up, like, hash rate migrate to me. It's like, that's going to just become a normal thing. One day there will be the race to, like, uh, to find the cheapest electricity and they'll be deploying those units wherever that electricity is. Well, I guess that's happening now, but, you know. That's just uh, <laughs> until we keep going forward, we're just it's gonna keep growing. So, all right. So, what's the news with Bitmex? So, fucking cucks. But <laughs> what? <laughs> That's not the way. But um, yeah. Despite cucking um to the establishment. They have actually produced a um, a pretty good improvement for a proof of reserves design. Um, and for anybody not familiar with that, um, you clearly have never listened to Nick Carter. Um, but the general idea is that if I'm an exchange, I can take all of the Bitcoin UTXOs I own and sign something with the keys controlling them and then i take the account balances of all my users um, and remove identifying information um, generally hashing some hashing all of it with a nonce um, so that users can verify their information but it's not immediately publicly visible like hey this is fud's coinbase balance um, and if this is done frequently enough and enough users check this regularly, the idea is that if they're constantly signing with keys to prove they control Bitcoin, they probably actually have those keys. Um, and if users are constantly checking their attestation of their account balance, then any user who has their attestation not match what they should have um, can call bullshit and provide some proof of that in some way and know not to trust that exchange they're not fully solvent but the issue privacy wise is just hashing your information um that protects your identity but it still leaks a shit ton of information about account balances when they change increase decrease and a lot of that could still be used potentially to you know, figure out who somebody actually is, even though their information isn't publicly revealed. But it also just leaks a lot of information about that business, about traders on that business, which could be detrimental to them. So BitMEX came up with the idea in uh, essentially just breaking up um, everybody's account balance attestations into multiple fragments that are randomly decided from a, a random number generator like how many different buckets to break your account up in and how to distribute the value between them um, so that it's still providing all the same guarantees to users who are verifying this but it's made it way more difficult to actually you know figure out what is going on with account balance changes inside this business or associate things to a specific individual potentially. And so despite being a bunch of giant cucks, um, yeah, I think they have just really improved the privacy profile of something that custodial businesses could use to prove that they're not fractional reserve. Well, good job, cucks. Don't you praise them, they're cucks. <laughs> Well, it's just good to see that, you know, these exchanges, exchanges are trying to, uh, you know, make these adjustments to try and, you know, advance the industry. It's not just like stagnant. How come BlockFi don't do that, FUD? Hmm? Hmm? What? Where, where's the BlockFi proof of reserve? Hmm? Hmm? I'm waiting, man. This is one space where Leaden is doing it right. Like, dude, out of all businesses in this space, um, 
those are probably the ones that should be getting pressured to do schemes like this, like more so than just regular exchanges. Yeah, BlockFi should definitely do it. I mean, like, uh, they're, I just know that they've got a lot of customers. It would uh, provide some sort of, I don't know, you know, sigh of relief. Yeah, I super support the idea. I think Nick Carter is doing the right thing, championing it for everybody who's holding your Bitcoin. Uh, looking forward to more of that coming. I'm trying to remember how often Leaden does it, whether they do it once per quarter or it's once per half of the year. It's one of the two. They should do it way more often than that. All right, but I guess next up real quick. So uh, Bull Bitcoin. Um, Francis Poulier's non-custodial exchange in Canada that just spits your Bitcoin straight out into your own wallet when you buy it. Um, just acquired um, another Canadian company, Verify, um, which from everything I can find out about is kind of um, a similar type of business, more with the angle of unchained capital i guess where they actually are kind of offering a more helping hand to get people you know sorted properly with custody and key management before bitcoin shows up somewhere um so all of that stuff is going to get pulled in and integrated into bull bitcoin and i just have to say um more people should be figuring out how to structure on and off ramps like this and fucking get after it in other jurisdictions. And it blows my mind that that's not a thing. Yeah, good job on Bull Bitcoin and uh, Francis for taking this move because definitely, yeah, like we're saying, advancements in the industry. I mean, dude, he built a business that had to bow to KYC AML laws and figured out a way to make it atomic and non-custodial. Um, why the fuck aren't other Bitcoiners building similar things? You got me. I mean, if you're out there working on this stuff, you should definitely be uh, paying attention to that. All right, so but. I guess... Um, that takes us to Janine with a comical interlude. This is what everybody pays attention to. Yes, some lighthearted comedic relief from the shitcoiners. On August 10th, the Poly Network had over $610 million worth of crypt assets stolen. Wait, what is the Poly Network today? Well, their website says... Poly Network is built to implement interoperability between multiple chains in order to build the next generation internet infrastructure. Authorized homogeneous and heterogeneous, public blockchains can connect to Poly Network through an open, transparent admission mechanism and communicate with other blockchains. Poly Network has already integrated Bitcoin, Ethereum, NEO, Ontology, Elrond, Zilliq. Zilliqua, Binance Smart Chain, Switchio, and Hoibi EcoChain. More institutions and organizations are welcome to join Poly Network and build the next generation internet with us. All right, enough buzzword bingo. They posted a message on Twitter urging the hacker to return the stolen funds. It says, Dear hacker, we are the Poly Network team. We want to establish communication with you and urge you to return the hacked assets. The amount of money you hacked is the biggest one in the DeFi history. Law enforcement in any country will regard this as a major economic crime and you will be pursued. It is very unwise for you to do any further transactions. The money you stole are from tens of thousands of crypto community members, hence the people. You should talk to us to work out a solution. And uh, while they were waiting for their prayers to be answered, a guy named Carlos Estrada rewrote the message to be, let's say, more forceful. And since I've now read it three times out loud, I'm able to not completely burst out laughing when I read it, so I will share it with you now. Thank you. 
Dear Hacker, we are the Poly Network team, you fucker. We want to establish communication with you and urge you to return the hacked assets or we're going to beat your ass. The amount of money you hacked is the biggest one in the DeFi history. Law enforcement in any country will regard this as a brilliant yet major economic crime and your ass will be pursued. It is very fucking stupid for you to do any further transactions, you dirty bastard. My 10k I was planning on using to buy a JPEG rock is gone now, bitch. The money you stole are from tens of thousands of crypto community members like myself, so it specifically pisses me off even more. I have the board of directors on my ass, so we need to figure this out, this shit out, bitch. You better talk to us and work out a solution, son of a bitch. Poly Network team. <laughs> a 10k JPEG? Yeah, but, uh... That was uh that was not the end of the story. Um on August twelfth, Poly Network tweeted out that uh well, they had established communication with the hacker. And they said all remaining user assets on Ethereum except for the frozen USD tether had been transferred to the multisig wallet controlled by Mr. White Hat and Poly Network team. To achieve the goal of full recovery of both assets and cross chain services, the team will continue to communicate with Mr. White Hat actively to receive the final key. Um, our friendly neighborhood blockchain surveiller, Mr. Tom Robinson at Elliptic, shared that the hacker had embedded a full-blown Q&A in some Ether transactions. So we actually get to hear directly from them. And uh, it's quite hilarious. I will read some of them for you. Thank you. All right. So there's four parts. Part one, why hacking? Answer, for fun, smiley face. Uh, question two. Why Poly Network? Answer. Cross-chain hacking is hot. <laughs> Why transferring tokens? Answer. To keep it safe. When spotting the bug, I had a mixed feeling. Ask yourself what to do had you facing so much fortune. Asking the project team politely so that they can fix it? Anyone could be the trader given one billion. I can trust nobody. The only solution I can come up with is saving it in a trusted account while keeping myself anonymous and safe. Um, and he, in parts two and three, he goes into kind of some of the detail of how he discovered the bug, sort of. Um, and I will skip to part four, but because it is probably the most entertaining part. All right, part four. Uh, there's a question that says, why refund? Coward? And his answer is, whatever, smiley face. When you judge others, you do not define them. You define yourself. I already enjoyed what I cared most, hacking and guiding. Few hackers can understand the situation of DeFi security. Yes, you see a lot of hack, but most of them are not enjoyable as a real hacker. Some stupid code leads to huge amount of loss, but it's not challenging. It's like fighting against a teenager. <laughs> I would admit the poly hack is not as fancy as you imagine, but I did experience something new from the project. I would say figuring out the blind spot in the architecture of poly network would be one of the best moments in life. I have got enough money as the growth of the crypto world. I have been exploring the meaning of life for a while. I hope my life can be composed of unique adventures, so I like learn and hacking everything in order to fight against the fate. <laughs> Sein zum Tod, uh, which translates to being toward death in German. Uh, it's a Heideggerian phrase that refers to anxiety about death, driving a person to achieve authenticity in life. That is my side note. Uh, in conclusion, the end says, to be honest, I did have some selfish motives to do something cool, but not harmful by leveraging the huge fund like the Dow idea. Then I realized being the moral leader would be the coolest hack I could ever achieve. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, hacker. That is funny. I mean, really funny. I mean, whenever I saw that they were asking for the funds back, I thought that was a laugh and, you know, whatever, you know, this is crypto. But when he gave the funds back, that made me laugh. I was like, oh, man, that is, uh, that's funny. Like, uh, well, we'll see. Uh, I'm sure uh, maybe they learned a lesson. Rick, are you going swimming? Is is ETH ever going to have a smart contract that can't get hacked? Like, no. is that ever going to exist? Is it, is, no. is it going to be a thing? No. No. I mean, like, I'm reminded of the DevOps 4 uh, story where, like, uh, you know, the guy was just having fun and, like, uh, wrecked Oops. that multi-sig. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not in a tub um, or a bath. It is pouring rain in Colorado. It's, you know, in these mountains. Like, I live in some mountains, so it rains. We create weather up here. Isn't that the same thing? Do you not bathe in the rain? Sometimes, yeah. I should, yeah. I'm actually uh, due for a shower. I should probably go out there. My my favorite part of the Q&A is he said that, you know, this isn't even really enjoyable. It's stupid code, and it was like fighting against a teenager. Well, that's the way these guys are, you know. These uh, these developers that are creating this crazy new DeFi pathways, like, uh, it usually is just some teenagers. Also, cross-chain hacking is hot. Hotter than NFTs. What? is up next it looks like some mass mutual bitcoin fund yeah this is a story that is almost no longer a story because it happens so frequently so mass mutual the insurance company uh to recap they bought around a hundred million dollars uh via nidig back in december and also bought a $5 million stake in NIDEG at the same time. Hmm, what is Coinbase doing over there? Oh, never mind. Uh, it has now announced, much like some other major wealth management and, and wealth guidance companies, that they are going to be offering NIDIG's funds, NIDIG Bitcoin funds to their clients. Ta-da! So basically, NIDIG serves most of the investment world when it comes to Bitcoin. Good job, NIDIG. One more win. Nice. Really? That is a company to pay attention to because I really don't like the idea of one provider like that being the one doing all the plugging in of legacy institutions to Bitcoin rails. Um, yeah. I agree with that. Uh, we need diversity here. And this is one place where the SEC, Mr. Ginsler, you know, do your thing, getting everybody in line on compliance with all these other tokens that are out there. But we need guidance and we need availability in the Bitcoin space. And I know you, Mr. Ginsler, are a fan of Bitcoin. So, I would ask, why don't we have a Bitcoin ETF that we can put our retirement funds in yet? And, you know, I'm sure you understand that we feel stuck here with Grayscale that doesn't trade at Bitcoin price and can be at massive discount or massive premium. And, you know, we've felt both now and nobody particularly likes it either way. And I would just have to think, sir, that you wouldn't encourage us to go to Canada for financial products that we just need to save in for our retirement. So I'll appeal to you, Ginsler, and all these other companies over time, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, to get your self-custody game in order. I know you're doing it. Uh, so here's the deal. These guys are going to run white box software. Uh, that's completely compliant, that'll work for their purposes, you know, hopefully interfaces with everything else they do. And that was the big headline on some of these NIDIG integrations was that they're integrating to the back end of bank software that essentially audits banks real time. Uh, it is the accounting software for banks of which there are a handful that are approved by the feds, uh, known versions, known bugs, long time tests run against it. You know, this is software that was written a long time ago that has not changed for a long time uh, for numerous reasons, one of them being reliability. So when they start plugging into all these layers and make it really easy for other people to provide their services because they're there at a layer like a, a phone app or an api plugin what however you like to talk about it you know they make it really easy for us to go and get a hold of bitcoin so in that sense they're a front runner but i just have to imagine that the largest custody organizations and banks will take it in-house over the next however many years it takes them to have on-site 
and staff in-house that knows how to deal with Bitcoin all the way down to physical hardware. Okay, log scale. But um It's coming. It's one of those things where it's like uh we might not like what happens, but things like that happen. I mean adoption it happens. Yeah, I mean it does. I mean this is very important shit, but it's like things need to move along to where the actual funds are custodied and controlled by a more distributed group of entities or that can go in a weird direction. You know, like every time ETF proposals have come up on this show, my stance has consistently been let them all through because the worst thing that could fucking happen is like one or two huge ETFs that start becoming giants in terms of consensus on the network. You don't want that. You want a bunch of little ones. Yeah, I agree completely huge well i don't know what what is that entry like 35 of subtle ways that you can attack bitcoin that most people probably don't think about stop it you know you're gonna give them the the answer to defeat bitcoin one of the other take homes here is that again this is an insurance company of which we haven't heard of many in this space there's certainly um investment organizations and banks that have and exchanges that have been out with news around this sort of thing but insurance companies have not been as prevalent so uh just one more thing that we would like to see on those sorts of offerings long term as we get more and more gray hairs around here so uh cheers I'm starting to wonder why I even put this up on the news desk right now, this next thing, because I think all I'm going to wind up doing is embarrassing myself. Um, But, oh well. When has that ever stopped you? Oh, dude. (laughs) You got to talk about the hottest new craze, the NFTs. So there is some indie sci-fi movie called Silhouettes. Um that is issuing tickets to watch the movie as NFTs on Liquid. What? Oh, I don't know Liquid. why the hell I did this, um, but probably just in, in search of, of something to do with this tiny amount of LBTC I had. I bought one. I'm probably going to watch <laughs> it later tonight. But, um, um, yeah. You went down um, the NFT rabbit hole. It's it's just them looking at like tokenized ticketing services and shit like that, and it's like, yeah, I, I I'm I'm embarrassed now, but like, okay, I'm just a sucker for fucking indie sci-fi movies. That's what this boils down to. But, and um, liquid, so it's like doubly <laughs> down. But um, yeah, I mean, like tokenized tickets for like events and shit like that i mean i don't think that's an insane use case but it's called chow me and ecash people um it's much more scalable than a blockchain so um yeah i mean i I don't know it's interesting that somebody is playing around with this but if if this is going to be a tech anybody wants to see deployed at scale um this is not a good use for a token on a blockchain. Just make a Xiaomi and eCash mint, and when the event's done, you can delete the database and don't have an unscalable blockchain that has to be tracked in perpetuity. Hey man, if it fixes the Ticketmaster game and all of that kind of crazy fraud, I mean, like, maybe we do need a blockchain. <laughs> don't you just need a Xiaomi and eCash server, man? That's it. That's all you need. All right. All right. Well, NFT is still, like, when are you going to get a rare Pepe? What are you talking about, dude? I've been had rare Pepes for years, man. I'm holding an open oh. dime with a thousand Pepe cash on it right now. Okay. So I you eggplant yeah. rare Pepe somewhere laying around. I didn't throw <laughs> it out. Nope, here it is right here. Got that here on this open dime, too. We need to get Theo back on the podcast and talk about NFTs one day because they're <laughs> just out of the craze. And he's been the man for the longest time. Only if everybody gets drunk. 
I'm sorry, but no. if Theo comes back, I want my fucking shit faced Block Digest episode. And we gotta have like Chris and Blake with that episode. It'd be just like the shit. I'm not getting drunk. I well, you mean then you can't be on the episode. I don't you know what try else to say. How dare Everybody's you? Everybody's got Just try a beer with us. Just w- one trial. I have tried. They're all disgusting. Okay. Well, that would be a fun night. Still, we'll plan Rick, that one this out is somehow. clearly proof that she's lying. I can do a white <laughs> Russian. Okay, see? Lots there. of milk. Lots of milk, All right. so I can barely taste it. Well, we just need to set it up. Chowmian sounds like a great name for something at a concession stand that does NFTs. Chow. Chow. All right, well, let's... Let's get the NFT story going and chow from this one on to the next uh, amazing advancement of strike. Chow me in. Good old strike. You know what they do now? I hear they sell Bitcoin. Yeah. That's the news, boys and girls. Be excited. What? It's a Bitcoin buy tab? Yep, I think the the deal is one of you guys should chime in um, on on this that's used it firsthand if anybody has. Uh, but yep, supposedly their buy tab is out of beta, and I believe you can you can buy yourself the bitcoins in Strike. I don't know if that means to your Strike account or direct to chain. What the meaning of this is? Um, I think it's custodial to start. Um although I still haven't used it and you can withdraw, but yeah, I'm just interested. Like dude, Jack, I think is like, he's playing a ballsy ass game. I think long-term yeah. um, with like the business model of this company. Cause it, it's really like the fee structure for things, even, even accounting a runway period. Like it's like he's structuring all of this to make all of his money on the back end and not off of his users, like routing fees off the lightning network. Not much now, but long term could wind up being huge revenue. Like he has to hedge on the back end and he's like, you know, acknowledge this when he's come on the show before to talk about strike. Like they are leveraged on the back end to protect themselves against volatility like that there is another means of revenue not really dependent on fees from their users and like my thinking here in terms of like being able to just make this an explicit on-ramp off-ramp for purchasing and not a payment mechanism that's just kind of being used like that anyway sometimes like there has to be some kind of back-end like deal with brokers or OTC desks where just bringing them liquidity, he can get a fee or a kickback from the broker and not pass that on as an explicit cost to the user. And I just think like if he can actually pull this off in the fucking back, man, like it's crazy because it's like this whole business from like my point of view and assessment of it would be just generating all the revenue off their infrastructure instead of their users. And the more users they have, that amplifies the revenue off their infrastructure instead of just charging the users outright. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, like, I've been seeing people buying Bitcoin, guys like Parabolic, just like, you know, buying large stacks with uh, no fees. And I mean, you know, that's where I think a lot of people are making their way into strike trying to buy Bitcoin and yeah, you could withdraw it. I mean, uh, there's not really any kind of uh, whitelisting process for withdrawals or anything. So, I mean, buying without fees and withdrawals, I mean, I mean, like, like you're saying, I mean, this, if you know how to uh, route in the Lightning network and you know how to time your, uh, your, when you're going to actually uh, post on the, on uh, Bitcoin and, you know, how to route those fees in a way that advantages you, then yeah, you don't have to really put that on the user and you're just going to make your money by the sheer volume that you're handling. And I'm I'm nearly certain that's kind of the model. I mean, that's where you got a whole country behind this platform and, uh, you know, similar models. And I mean, I think it's going to work. I mean, as somebody that's been 
just watching it develop and used it for a, a while like i mean it's been very sleek uh process i mean like yeah there's like uh there was some heavy kyc at the beginning and uh you know i would like to see uh the sh you know i'm just talking about there's somebody here locally that i need to work with and i'm gonna set them up on uh, strike and just sort of see what the onboarding process is now it's been a while since i onboarded and i'd like to see exactly how things go but um i'm sure it's still a smooth process i'm gonna get them to pay me bitcoin but, I mean, I'm sorry. With, this, with this product uh jack now may actually have completed his white label package that probably looks really nice to banks, to countries, to just about everybody as a demo. Uh, he's definitely talked about open sourcing parts of that. And I don't, I don't know how much or how little of that full stack is open. Uh, I completely agree with you. It's the flows in and out of this and the advantages that can be taken there that ultimately make the bulk of the money off this product and essentially the bandwidth, the throughput of users is just more to, to resell to other people who want the flows, right? Because uh, both ends would like to plug into these types of services to source and sync liquidity around the globe. And there's a huge market of this already. Uh, this is a really interesting puzzle piece that can either sit parallel or fit into that market. And uh, I think he's got a, a great stack that a lot of people are going to want to talk to him about. Well, I mean, I I'm trying to go even deeper than just the software stack. Like the node infrastructure on the Lightning Network that's required. Like he's making routing fees off shit that has nothing to do with Strike users unless they explicitly wall off their nodes to not do that. So they have revenue just from that infrastructure that does not have to be amortized across their user base. And the more they build that infrastructure out properly, the more that's the case. So like they literally get revenue from that infrastructure that has nothing to do with their users creating costs for them. So like that is a potential revenue stream. And then when they have to take a certain amount of their liquidity to hedge against the Bitcoin volatility, they can make money off of that in addition to that. And like whether like it doesn't matter how much like their users are using the liquidity allocated to shit, like there's still going to be this hedge that is also a potential revenue generating stream. So it's like they, they actually do have potential here for streams of revenue that do not um, have to cover their user costs or, or like get passed on to their users like that. You know, you know what I mean? Like it's this is just free revenue just existing, not dependent directly on their user base. Absolutely. And it's not clear to me how many other finance players are really in on this game yet, as it were. I don't think it's a lot. It's more like some of them have their pinky toe in the Olympic swimming pool right now. Uh, as they do get interested in that, that's just going to make people hungry to buy Jack out. So... We'll, we'll see how long he wants to run with this or if he wants to be like a billionaire. Don't I know. think, I think he's, he's like, like, just tell him get fucked. Like, right. keep doing that. He's not going to sell out, man. That's not happening. I mean, this is like, this is, he's taken, there's a reason why Brian Armstrong's coin is worth $257 and it launched at 250 and it's going to go down more. And like, like Jack Maller said, he's going to eat his fucking lunch because of the fact that they want to play this stupid fucking crypto game. And he's going to show them that this is Bitcoin has the liquidity. If you want to play that crypto game, you're about to lose because Jack's like you're saying. I mean, he's created this very nice streamlined stack to where people can get in and get out of Bitcoin if they want. And, you know, like uh, good luck, Brian Armstrong. Good luck, all you other guys that are playing that stupid old game of trying to sell other people's shitty assets. Like people want Bitcoin, Jack's gonna give it to him, and I mean he's got access to it. He's got these, uh, you know. I mean, as far as like revenue streams, I mean, like the guy, like and like you're saying, these big players, they want in on this. They want to invest in Jack. They want to give this guy money, but they can't. You know, I mean, like there's, you know, this guy's. I mean, like you know, he's a, uh, you know, like somebody said recently, he's like he's like a, you know, a Steve Jobs in the space. I mean, he's somebody that's gonna really be a force to reckon with. I don't think he's selling out, not at all. Square is going to want a similarly distributed network for their own use, right? Visa is going to want to run over 
everybody else's networks and their own. Uh, Jack early identified that open standard is where we're headed to. That really is the answer in the open source world that we have here today. And what's fun is he's out there running and kind of setting a bar and giving everybody else something to look at and follow. And as we follow, we're just going to get a network that works well together. And ultimately, that's going to be good for everybody because we'll have open source access on top of that, which should lead a bit way better for you and me. You know, instead of going to the bank and dealing with the hassle of having something like a merchant account to accept credit cards, we'll be able to do it over Lightning. It'll be great, relatively. Yep. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. I mean, like we're just saying, there's a lot of different developments in uh, these in this field, but this is one where, uh, for sure, it just there seems to be a lot of just potential growth. And uh, yeah, I mean, Square, but also Twitter. I mean, uh, I saw something about Jack tweeting about Lightning payments. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, the only reason I'm maybe still sitting on Twitter is there's still some interesting discussions there and like uh, potential for. We'll see what happens. I don't know. Yep. Keep running, Jack. You you give the other Jack somebody to look at. You're daring him to bring things like payments to Twitter. Oh, gosh. Right on. Jeez. All right. Well, yeah, that's awesome. So, uh, <laughs> just, Autism. uh, yeah, bringing us right into, uh, what is the space chain proof of burn replacement? Autism. Autism time. Oh, we got to get Ruben on here, huh? Uh, yeah, it's, it's about time for that. But um, yeah, we we've had Ruben Samson on a few times to talk about state chains, about his different uh, side chain designs. Um, but he he has one in particular that would utilize his kind of L two covenant um, blind merge mining where you create a transaction that can only recreate the same output over and over again into infinity, but still allows you to add inputs and outputs to the transaction um, so that you can commit to like a sidechain block. And his initial concept for this would be a one-way peg where you actually burn and destroy your Bitcoin um, in order to peg coins into the sidechain. Well, he has a new potential replacement for that, where in instead of um, kind of burning them, what you could do is use some mechanism like a, anyone can spend output or a large number of them and time lock Bitcoin for like a year or two so that instead of burning them um you just leave them for the miners to be able to claim at some point in the future and incentivize like more security for the network that miners would know ahead of time exists there to compete for outside of fees and subsidies and smooth it out so that it's kind of distributed evenly across some time period and um, that way it doesn't create like this weird incentive to like just fight reorging the same block a hundred times because there's this one massive output that miners can claim. But um, yeah, um, this would be a potential replacement mechanism to peg into a space chain that didn't require just destroying your Bitcoin forever and actually doing something to kind of incentivize added hash rate um, to secure the network in the future. So, you know, I, I just think it's, I, I still kind of stand on my opinion that if you want to use a space chain, um, just use a Bitcoin federation and native tokens on it um, and improve the security model there with the federation interacting with users. but. I still think this is an interesting thing to think about. And honestly, despite disagreeing with like half of the shit Ruben's come up with, it's just like he just keeps coming up with interesting concepts that are actually just new and shit that I have not heard before. Like, it's a fun guy to talk to. 
The Space greatest chain. It's the track. chain. <laughs> I was just going to say, Bitcoin attracts bright minds. I mean, uh, yeah, it's uh, some interesting stuff. I remember the first time we went through state chains, I was just sort of blown away. And, and now uh, this sounds like something I need to investigate more time in. Investigate. More, invest more time. In. Yeah. Investigate. So uh, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. I guess really. Next up is just a quick mention until this really progresses further, but um, Sparrow Wallet, a uh, desktop um, PSBT-based wallet in Java, uh, is apparently starting work on integrating Whirlpool coin joins um, into Sparrow Wallet. And this is really interesting because we've seen things like Chaincase kind of fork the Wasabi implementation of ZeroLink and start running their own coordinator um, with their own client, but using like uh, the same protocol, which is tweak values for uh, coin join denominations. But we haven't yet see a wallet integrate support for an existing coordinator in something. So I just think this is going to be really interesting to play out. Um, and I do think that this could potentially have um, privacy consequences if, peop- if if Sparrow Wallet doesn't effectively implement all of the heuristics and little fingerprints that Samurai uses for all of their transaction constructions. Um, because if you have somebody from Sparrow Wallet go into Whirlpool and CoinJoin, but then because the general little you know fingerprints when samurai constructs a transaction are different than when sparrow wallet does there is potential there to kind of have sparrow wallet users after mixing stand out explicitly um with these little fingerprints from whirlpool users that are actually using samurai wallet which could kind of fragment and completely undermine any anonymity set gains there. So I think like that really is like something Sparrow Wallet needs to get down to the tiniest little T and fingerprint. Otherwise, like you, you, you know, I mean, you would just have two sets that could potentially stand out from each other. I need to check out the Sparrow. I mean, it, it'd be nice to see, but it's like Sparrow Wallet on their side really needs to cross all the T's and dot all the I's there, or like this could wind up just not really having the impact that they think it would. Yeah, I mean, it's a fight, uh, you know, making advancements in the world of privacy, but uh, definitely need to be diligent about uh, all the steps you're taking. Sparrow, good job. And you know, check it out. So, so, how many years will it take Sparrow to open source their Dojo equivalent? <laughs> they uh, hook up to uh, your node right now. It's actually really um, kind of like feature wise and stuff, it, it really is pretty equivalent with Spectre for the most part. Uh, long taproot multi sig. You're here. All right. I guess that takes us to the last thing, which is you, Janine. Just another Assange update because on Wednesday, August 11th, there was a preliminary hearing for the U.S. government's appeal, um, and they spent the entire hearing arguing that one of the medical witnesses for the defense, Professor Professor Michael Kopelman, um, that his testimony, uh, as summarized by RSF regarding Assange's mental health, had been, quote, misleading, as his first written report to the court did not explicitly acknowledge that Assange had a partner and two small children, but had been admitted out of concerns for their privacy and safety. In an unusual step, um, 
ruling against the district judge, the high court found that this point would be arguable in the further than the next hearing, widening the scope of the grounds that the U.S. government can appeal um, the like on more grounds. Originally, there was five possible grounds. They were limited to two, and now it's been expanded, uh, which is pretty weird. It's a pretty weird thing to say that because a doctor did not dox a woman and her children that that somehow and and also he didn't he didn't dox them from the beginning not just in his second report which is by the time stella and the sons were publicly known about um it's extremely weird that that is the point the u.s government wants to argue on that a doctor did not dox a woman and her children soon enough uh and that makes him misleading um yeah, so that was pretty weird. Also, the weirdest thing to happen during the preliminary hearing was that um, apparently at the end of it, after everyone had left the courtroom, uh, the video link was still up for people who had remote access. And basically the defense called had the court call the prison to bring Assange back into the remote viewing room that he was in at Belmarsh. Oh yeah, by the way, he was not even brought to court. He was brought into a room at Belmarsh prison, which had video link access. So he wasn't even in court, which means he couldn't even speak to his defense team privately. And um, yeah, that kind of got awkward at the end because basically the de- the defense team was talking to him over a live video link that had other members of the press on it. Um, so yeah, you had a attorney client, you know, privileged conversation happening over a video link with other journalists. That is insane. The UK is insane. Um, And I guess we're going to see more of that because they scheduled the next proper hearing for the 27th and 28th of October. Yikes. So he didn't know that they were, there were still other people on the line whenever they were talking with him. Uh, no, the defense team did say that they thought people might still be listening, but they weren't sure it wasn't obvious to them. Okay. Well, still, it's crazy. Need to set that man free already. But, you know, no such thing as a free press or much free speech anymore. Yeah, and it's especially important given the events of this weekend. Um, yeah, like the the documentation provided by the documents published by WikiLeaks about the war in Afghanistan are super important to understanding how we got to this point and how it was basically obvious for a long time that this would be the end result at some point. It took a lot of ammunition to get us out of Afghanistan. And a lot of equipment. And unfortunately for Julian, uh, a lot of people's time. I mean, uh, we're not, I mean, you know, we might be getting out of Afghanistan, but it's certainly, uh, I don't know if it's actually going to help with Julian's case. So on that uh, note, we're going into final thoughts. I think I got something kind of just going straight into this. Like, um, I was thinking about, uh, you know, recently I saw, I guess it was, Glenn Greenwald and Tulsi Gabbard made a move over to a platform called Rumble Video. And I just started thinking more about like, you know, how can we in Bitcoin make uh, some sort of change towards uh, bringing people towards platforms that don't censor free speech, that don't censor speech. And I mean, like I was thinking about tweeting, but, you know, like I said earlier, I don't really like Twitter too much anymore. And I mean, maybe I'll say it here. Like, what do you guys think about moving over to like something like Rumble Video and trying to get others like big guys like Peter McCormick, Stephen Levera, you know, the, you know, the Tales from the Crypt guys, like, 
uh, Pomp, Anthony Pompliano, Orange Pill Podcast, all these people are on YouTube and have like big platforms on YouTube. But like to to go to something else, like um, I don't know if it's Rumble Video or if it's BitChute or what it is, but some other platform that sort of uh, just denotes like that we're not really uh, with the censorship of speech and uh, that's not what this space is about. And if we could make the move to steer traffic in those directions and those avenues that are, you know, trying to make a genuine effort to bring free speech uh, to the Internet still, um, maybe we should make those moves and try to encourage others to make those moves. And I was also just thinking about if somebody can make a good, I don't know, I need to spend more time on Mastodon, but like uh, if there was some sort of good... uh, um, similar to the way there's like the Wayback Machine and like uh, archive.i is where like there's a bot that'll take a screenshot of a website. If we can have something like that, just sort of relay information between um, different social networks, we could kind of like, uh, you know, just bring the information over to these other channels like Mastodon and Bitcoin hackers. And I'm just thinking about how do you get people to support places that, uh, that don't censor and like, how do we encourage that? And I just like, as my final thought, I just wanted to bring that up. Like how do, what do you guys think about these other platforms? You mean you don't like talking about the tallies and the Rona? I don't like feeling like I do have to self censor where I don't understand what the cue is. That's going to get us, you know, like uh, to where we're not showed up in recommendations or anything, which like, I mean, you know, there's been people on Twitter that say that they haven't seen an episode of Block Digest in a while because, you know, we're not recommended. And, you know, I don't know whether or not we're banned or shadow banned or whatever. I don't think we're banned, but I mean, we're not banned, but I mean, whatever. We're still like uh, supporting this place that bans people for talking about stuff and that's where I was just thinking, like, as much as it, <clears throat> I mean, it's not that big of a deal, but I mean, I was just thinking, like, we, you know, I set up a Rumble video account. It wasn't that hard, but I need to set up, like, a pit shoot account, and I don't know. I mean, like, once we get to these other platforms, I don't know how much it would help, but if we could get these other guys to help do that, like, you know, like, guys like Peter McCormick, if you're out there, Stephen Levera, like, you know, Marty Bent, Matt O'Dell, like, uh, you know, Max Kaiser, Stacy, like uh, you guys, y'all have big followings. Like you know, if you could move all that traffic over to a platform that doesn't censor, that'd be awesome. It kind of sounds like a proof of keys style situation, and you know, the time to do it is before you have to do it. Uh, so you're used to it, your followers are used to it, and it allows people to express their opinions on that sort of stuff and kind of the situation to evolve a little bit instead of the zero to one of having to go over there quickly and not knowing the lay of the land yet. Um, It seems to me like it's more and more evident that that's where independent content is going to have to go off YouTube. Uh, This technocracy of censorship and right think and the the willingness to step up and form or try to form somebody's opinion for them is just absolutely evident in what these things are and what their business models are. So at some point, we're going to have to jump off of these platforms. And it probably is also a good idea to look into what aspects of all of your content you host yourself at this point you know some people are really good about that and and some people rely on a lot of services and that just kind of goes out to everybody doing everything whether you're snapping pictures on your phone uh, that are saved up in a cloud somewhere or saving out your spreadsheet or you know whatever you do where do you keep your passwords at Uh, it might be time with the recent apple news and the general government trend and the general trend on access uh, to just think about what could fail and how much it would hurt you and where, where you might want to take that in response and start to do some baby steps. Have, have a little bit of pain now 
instead of a lot of pain when the systems that you were complacent with didn't ultimately perform for you. Yep. Well, yeah, I just think we should be doing that. Like, uh, you know, we should be making that sort of effort uh, if we can. Just um, create a block digest uh, bit shoot account and maybe just start uh, uploading stuff over there and pointing people over there and just uh, tell people on YouTube, like, hey, this is the last uh, few episodes we're hosting on YouTube and then we just uh, shut it down. Yeah, you know, read the room everyone we've been inching towards papers please travel you know if we make it to papers please travel i think they can do just about whatever they want with the internet so just keep keep that in mind and uh try to use the internet in a way that will keep you free right on shit's gonna get fucked get ready but the doggies are safe any more final thoughts besides that? <laughs> um, I guess I have one. Today has blown my mind at how delusional and just panicky and disconnected from reality Ethereum people are becoming in trying to argue Ethereum's superiority to Bitcoin. It blows my mind. Like they are just showing a fractal inability to understand how any part of systems like these work at all. I was literally told today that if a single Bitcoin transaction that got put in a block and confirmed was ever reorged and, and, and was pulled out of the blockchain and double spent, then Bitcoin is not immutable and it would crash to zero. Like, holy shit. That's happened many times. Um, that's not how blockchains work. That's not how proof of work works. That's not how immutability works. Just like, holy shit. These people are so stupid works. and so desperate. Blows my mind. Yeah, you, you guys got anything else though? All right. Uh, I guess that is all. And uh, catch you later, punks. Later, everyone. Cheers. Peace. <laughs> Yeah, you can have food, sir, yet. Yeah, you see it, Nick. Yeah, I see it. It is so good, yeah.